Hi, my name is Klesia Mensch and welcome to Womanhood from the Inside Out. In this interview series, we'll be discovering and uncovering the nature of womanhood from the inside out. Why is it important? When does it show? How can we identify it? And what are the implications of womanhood from the inside out? And today, I've got my dear friend, Gabriela Maldonado Montano. For over 20 years, Gabriela has worked to release the natural genius and well-being within individuals, teams, and organizations. She spent over a decade working for Santa Clara County Department of Alcohol and Drug Service Department, three principal services divisions, where she led projects across a wide breadth of SCC departments, including hospitals, probation, corrections, and social services. Driven and inspired by the results of her clients, she co-founded Through Change Consultants, a firm that assists organizations to meet challenges and rise to their highest aspirations for learning uh, by learning the inside-out nature of human performance. Although no longer an active owner, she remains senior trainer, coach, and thinking partner. Gabriella's heart lies in helping children lead joyful lives. She was co-director of the Center of the Sustainable Change, a U.S. national nonprofit which aimed to transform the lives of children and youth in distress. In collaboration with Antonio Gomez, Spanish writer extraordinaire, she developed a children's book that will be published this year. And currently, Gabriella lives in Silicon Valley and loves being part of this mecca of innovation and diversity. Her human potential consulting works spans a wide range of national and international clients in a variety of ethics, religions, and cultural settings. Welcome, Gabriella. Hi, Clesia. How are you? That's a long bio, so thank you for <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> I, I, I am great. I'm delighted. I'm excited. I'm so looking forward for this show today. And naturally, first of all, I need to thank Antonio Gomez from the bottom of my heart because he was the one who connected us. When yes. I, I would love to meet Gabriela Maldonado Montano and mm-hmm. he was on it. So uh, I, I'm attempting my terrible Spanish, but Antonio, muchas gracias. Un abrazo. Si me estáis escuchando. Mwah. Yeah. It were man in Portuguese. How was it? Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's, he's amazing. He's an amazing writer and he's an amazing person too. Yes. And yes. I'm grateful that he connected us, Glesia. So mm. I'm glad to be here. So here we are. And I would like to get on with it straight away. So how did he come across the principles? Um, I came across the principles in 1996, November. Um, I was working for a nonprofit, a local nonprofit here in the Valley, Silicon Valley. Um, And this nonprofit served the community. And my department and my position um, served children in school. Um, And so we would go to trainings. We were funded by the Department of Alcohol and Drug Services, who is, which is um, uh, part of the Santa Clara County mm-hmm. here in the Valley. And there were trains that were open. So the director of the department, Robert Garner, had contracted uh, with Dr. Roger Mills. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Roger Mills is uh, one of the original founders of the Center for Sustainable Change in collaboration with his daughter, Amy Mills. And so Roger was doing these trainings around the county and our agency was invited to go. And so my my dear friend and first supervisor, Billy King, said, you know, we're going. And uh, personally, at the time, I was going through a divorce, and I was just in really low, low spirits. Um, And, you know, it's funny looking back, because I generally like to dress up a little bit, but I remember exactly what I was wearing to that training. And I was wearing sweats. So sweats is, you know, like the things that you use 
to work out at the gym. <laughs> you know, which is, a, which is unlike me, but I think it was significant because I think at that time, um, life felt very effortful. Mm. And my spirits and my energy was very, very low. And so looking back, I just realized that um, wearing sweats to this work training mm -hmm. um, just really reflected how low in energy I was, and I was just barely able to wear sweats. And so then Roger Mills, Dr. Roger Mills, said um, in the training, it was a three-day, and there was one thing that just... Um, Run through, run true through my soul. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, those little bells that go bing. Right. And what he said was, no matter what's happened to you, no matter what's happening to you, there is a place in you that cannot be touched, that is resilient, and that it's the source of well-being. And I tell you, it was, um, it was like somebody just touched me over the shoulder or lifted a veil, and I knew that to be true. You know, so it's not like I had known that for the first time or heard that for the first time in my soul, in my being. I knew that, but I had forgotten during this period of um, distress in my life. And so personally, immediately, like, you know, I don't remember anything else. That's like what really touched me in that particular moment. So immediately, I just um, felt very um, hopeful and lighter. Just hopeful and lighter. Because at the time I was working in this nonprofit, there were a lot of people that were uh, therapist and psychologist and I remember asking um, a few of them actually how long am I going to feel like this you know how long am I going to really be impacted by this divorce mm -hmm. and I remember the answer of one of them and you know this this particular person is a lovely person I mean he's still my friend today but he said you know it's going to take you two years oh and I was like, you got to be kidding me. I don't think I can do this for two years. I think this is going to kill me, you know. This is because my energy was so low. So when I heard Roger said, you know, there's a part of me that's untouchable. I just was like, oh, thank God. And so the next day, I wore a suit again, which was very significant for me now because it's almost like I regain energy you know it's like oh okay um and so that's how i found out about the principles it personally touched me of course first mm -hmm. um and then i remember the next thing that i remember learning was um the principle of thought right and I was working with kids at schools, um, and so I went right, right away after, after I remember learning the principle of thought, and I started trying to share these principles with kids mm. in the best way that I could. Um, and you know, the, the beauty of working with kids is that they're so um, on um polluted about being polite mm. you know they're not i mean you know of course our parents do the best they can right but the kids are very like honest mm. so i would try to present something and then i would ask you know so did you understand that and they're like no <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> okay <laughs> You know, they were very honest, but very generous, too, because they were really willing to give me a second and third chances. And, um, and so for a couple of years, 
I was trained by Roger and by the department and uh, did a lot of, a lot, a lot of different trainings. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think I was right on target and, and many times I was not, mm. many times. But what kept me um, what kept me really um, in the path of wanting to learn more was that I was seeing results mm. in my life first and in the life of kids mm. and in the life of parents. And so I just realized, you know, there's something about understanding how you function as a human being that's very helpful. Mm. And, um, you know, continued. I later on got hired by the county, like you said, in my long bio. <laughs> and then I had the opportunity to work just in a, you know, a multitude of settings and with a multitude of people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was super exciting to me is that what we were sharing was not tied to culture, right? That it went beyond culture, that it went beyond age, that it went beyond uh, your particular religious beliefs, that there was something foundational. Oops, that's, I'm sorry, it's my phone. I'm going to turn that off. Um, but there was, are, the, are the bells you were talking about? <laughs> Like ding. it was kind of like that for my soul. It was like, remember, yes, <laughs> just like that. Um, I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? Was um, so are you t you're talking how it it goes beyond culture. It goes beyond yeah. religion. Yes. Yes, I was so excited about that because at that time here in the valley, the Silicon Valley, you know, we have a very um, ethnically diverse population and religious and it's just like a little mini population of the whole world mm -hmm. and so there was such emphasis about uh, cultural diversity and you know all that stuff that I was just so um, happy to see that these principles are uh, not connected to culture. I mean, there are a way to explain these principles that, you know, that can be aligned with cultural beliefs, but understanding at the most foundational level how we function, regardless of your ethnicity or your cultural background or your religious um, philosophies, it was just super exciting to me. That was really, and the only thing that was really exciting to me is that I was working with people um, that were executives, but I was also working with people that were working in the fields, right? So it was a range of education. Mm. And regardless of their level of education, because their foundational laws, people get it. Yes. So that just really, um, that has kept me really um, connected to this work. Mm. Mm. And that is, is very important and very interesting because it has to do with the, um, one of my mentors he used to say, um, these are not, be not beliefs, we are talking about principles. And hence the reason why it, it goes across cultures, it goes, it goes across education, it goes beyond beliefs, or even lack of religion. It doesn't matter because we are, it's just like gravity. It's a fact. It's a fact of life, of the experience of being human. So uh, many people can relate to it. And it's like something that occurred to me. You know that movie, Finding Nemo? <laughs> there, oh. I do. Uh -huh. yeah. I love that movie. I always like, uh, yes, I like cartoons. Oh, well. 
<laughs> so I was thinking when because Nemo and all the fishes they are swimming in the middle of the water, so probably they're not aware of the water, even though they need water in order to live, right? They are mm -hmm. all immersed and involved, it makes part of their environment. So just it occurred to me in this moment that it's the same thing with the principles. We are involved, we merge, we are living the principles and we're not even aware of it. And right. that's absolutely fine. It's that way by design. Right. Yeah. See that that's very I think that's a very good distinction to to make. Um, so when I was working with the people that were executives, they have a very long list of to do's. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and their schedules are very saturated, and they get many emails. And um, the fabulous thing about sharing something with them that was already at work, that didn't require a to do or an uh, um, incorporation or you know, a, a, a practice, mm -hmm. was helpful because their life's already so saturated. And so just recently, actually, I was talking to um, Katie Montano, mm -hmm. who happens to, to be a dear friend of mine and also is married to my husband's son. Right. So shout out to Katie. She's actually, <laughs> actually, she's a fantastic woman too. She's like a fantastic woman. Anyway, so I was doing some work with her and she happens to have this... Um, position in a company that is extremely heavy with duties. Mm. Um, and what she told me the last time we talked about this, she said, you know, in the middle of the day, while I was really caught up in the emails and, you know, the meetings and all this stuff, there was something in me, there was a voice in me that gave me insight mm. in And, you know, she likes to, you know, to do certain things to take care of herself. You know, she likes to walk and she likes to do other things. But what she told me, she goes, it was so helpful that I didn't have to do something, right? That I didn't have to, um, I don't know, whatever, practice these principles. Mm. Um, and so it was just uh, exciting for me to see that we're talking about something that people can realize in the moment, mm. right? in the middle of the storm in the middle of um, of life really you know I have this expression that I like to use when the rubber meets the road right mm -hmm. when things are like really tough mm -hmm. it's so um, it's so nice that this wisdom and this intelligence that we have in us even in those times speaks to us mm -hmm. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and it is not... Um, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Okay. That it is not reliant on us being on a certain state of mind. Right? Like, I don't have to be calm for wisdom to speak. I actually have been very upset before. And wisdom has slapped me, you know, like up you know like come on you know mm -hmm. so I like to say that because I um I've heard people have this um, um I think it's a misunderstanding that well I have to be calmer for wisdom to speak to me mm -hmm. and that's not true because wisdom is alive in every moment right yes so, so sometimes I think when we say, well, we need to be calmer for wisdom to speak and so we can get connected with our wisdom, I think really what we mean is that it's easier to hear it. Mm. But because we're talking about principles, laws of functioning, mm -hmm. um, they happen all the time. And for me, that actually, personally, again, has been a saving grace. You know, that I know I can be in the middle of, of a storm, that I can be in the middle of upset or that I can be in the middle of a, um, a time where I feel that life's very difficult mm -hmm. and that I know somewhere in my soul 
that this intelligence of life that we call mind is alive and well. Mm. Mm. I don't have to do something. It's alive and well. Yes. Yes. And for, I would say that most of us, we can remember a couple of situations where there was some sort of emergency happening and all of a sudden we had just this knowing, we knew exactly what to do. And we had no way intellectually of knowing that beforehand. But in that moment, when it was required, we almost get a flash or automatic download. Okay, do this, do that, do that. And, yes. it. and then when you look back, it was like, how did you do to do that? I don't know. And sometimes we even dismiss it. We don't think about it. O only afterwards, if we attempt to remember, I was like, wow, how did I know to do that? So mm -hmm. those examples are proven show that we are more in touch with that sort of wisdom than we make ourselves aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. See, and I, I love what you're, what you're bringing to the table because... Because the principles are alive and well all the time. Sometimes we are unaware of what's going on, right? We're just kind of like, like we're unaware a lot of the times that our blood is circulating through our bodies. Or we are unaware a lot of the times that we're breathing, right? Or we are unaware of um, our capacity to feel well. We are unaware of the fact that thought just passes through. We aren't aware that in the middle of difficult situations and emergencies, many times we have um, insights that are very appropriate to help us in the situation. Mm -hmm. We are so unaware all the time that sometimes we make, um, we create this misunderstandings about life. You know, like talking about emergencies, for example, um, so many of us try to prepare for emergencies, you know, like um, within the topic of relationship, let's just say, mm -hmm. well, you know, I'm not going to give all of my heart. I give part of my heart, right? Not all of it. Because what happens if something happens and then my heart breaks, right? <laughs> Why <are you> laughing? <laughs> I'm laughing because you're talking to me. I'm listening. <laughs> well, I'm going to have a cup of tea. Though. I went through a heartbreak. It took me two years. I was like, unfortunately, I didn't know about the principles then. Oh, well. <laughs> but I gave all of my heart, so I left nothing on the table. I was like, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't regret that, actually. I, I don't regret that I gave all of my heart, even though the, the thing did well. It worked out at the level that it had to work out. Yes, I don't regret a thing now on the inside. Right, yeah. So, you know, I think it's common, right? Like, these things happen to us, right? Life is, as Sid used to say, a contact sport, and you're going to get bruised and, you know, smacked around a couple of times. And so if we go um, through an experience like the one you're describing or, you know, whatever other experience, we just create this thing about, okay, well, let me, um, let me just kind of be careful about this, right? Mm -hmm. Because we think that we do not have the capacity to completely transcend the stress. You know, we don't remember. Mm -hmm. And so... We create um, experiences that are almost like half lift, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm not going to give it all in, in, a, in an effort to protect myself from suffering in the future. So knowing that there is a part of us that can never be broken, although it feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. But when you realize that, what's happened to me personally is it's, um, it's removed the fear of being hurt. Mm. I was afraid of being hurt. 
you know, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know about that because that doesn't feel so well, doesn't feel so good. So understanding how you function psychologically allows you to really understand life in such a way that it's almost like we are more in the game, you know, mm. more of enjoying life, more um, willing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it is possible that I will feel like my heart is breaking again in the future. That's possible. Mm. Right? It's possible. Um, it's likely. It's very likely. And yet, it's so grounding to know that even when I feel that my heart's breaking, that there is really, um, that that's just only thought in action, right? That's it. It's just thought in action. And that it is a result of consciousness, right? Because consciousness does such a great job that you really do feel like your heart's breaking, like in your chest, like in the middle of your chest, it feels like, you know, there's a breaking point here, right? So is it helpful if you're in relationships or is it helpful if you're in a situation that you're excited about but afraid that you might get hurt? to understand what's happening. Yes, it is. It is. It's absolutely fundamental. Mm. It is fundamental. Yeah. Can I give an example? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So a while back, I was working with a, a group of girls. They were incarcerated. They're minors, you know, young people. And many, many people, many of the girls that I was working with, had parents that could not be um, real present. Some of them, their parents were present, and some of them, their parents were not. Um, and some of their parents were in addiction, and some of their parents were incarcerated, etc. Right. And um, what I would notice is that there were many of these girls that felt. Um, really upset and really sad about the fact that they didn't have their parents. You know, I was, and then, and then there was this um, thing going around that a lot of, some of the girls, their moms in particular, would leave them mm. for men, right? Mm. Um, and there was a lot about, well, you know, what kind of a mom does that, right? She cares more about him than she cares about me and what does that mean about me ultimately, right? What does that mean about me? And we would have these conversations about, look, people do the best they can given what they're thinking. And the fact that your mom or your, both of your parents are not able to be present in your life the way you would like to has nothing to do with the value that you have as a human being. Because it's easy, you know, it's easy to get confused about that, especially when you were a, a young, young woman. And I remember this young woman saying, you know, my mom is just doing what she's doing. I wish she was here, but I can love her either way. You know, in that moment, during that conversation, I just felt the freedom of this kid's soul mm -hmm. to expand, you know? To kind of like grow and, and then also, you know, you can have a real conversation. It's possible that the mom will not show up for court. Mm -hmm. that she goes to court. That's possible. It's possible that she's going to do a lot of things um, that this kid or some, that would like her mom to do, right? Like she may not do them. But in the middle of the whole thing, it was just so interesting for the girls to have insight about their situation that was, that was helpful. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the reason why I keep on doing this is because I love, I love, love seeing what happens when people discover how they function so they can live life fully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And one of the things that I was remembering, Gabriella, is that um, when we had our, um, our first Skype conversation, to discuss the details of womanhood from the inside out. Um, you told me a story uh, where basically there was some sort of questionnaire about kids who had parents with addiction and there was some sort of myth yeah. around that. Could you tell us the story again? Because I, I feel that would help many people in our audience today. Yes, this was, you know, and it's, yeah, it's okay. So I was telling Plessia um, a story of when I was just entering the field and I was working for the nonprofit that I was, it's called Community Solutions. Um, so I was working for Community Solutions and my dear friend, Billy King, who I'm gonna be working with actually in a couple of weeks, um, him and I, he was my supervisor. And at the time we were going into the schools and working with kids, uh, doing prevention work, alcohol and drug prevention. Um, and the work that we were doing at that time was based on the disease model. Um, and so I was um, supposed to do a, uh, a pre and a post test for the kids. It was like 10 questions. And uh, one of the questions that, that if you are the child of an adult parent that is an alcoholic, that you by default, um, have a higher chance of becoming an alcoholic yourself, right? That was one of the questions that he handed down to me. And my mom was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. right? So um, she, she started drinking when I was probably around 12 or 13 after a traumatic experience that happened in our life. And um, when I read that question, I just... I just really had a gut reaction about that because when you're a child and your parent drinks heavily, mm -hmm. it's scary, right? And um, it just kind of didn't sit well with me that, that it would be helpful to t tell kids that this could happen to them, okay? So I omitted it this question and so I gave my version to my supervisor and he kicked it back to me and said you know you omitted this question so this happened three times where he would give it back and forth and back and forth and so he finally called me into my office and I said you know I just do not think this is helpful this was prior to us going to that training to the first training of the principals um, and so anyway, I think I was mandated at one point to just put it in the, in the test, you know. Um, but later on, I had a conversation with him. And he said, you know, you were right. You were right. And so, so, you know, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is really. But I know there's a bunch of us that have had parents that, that have been that have died from, from alcohol and other drugs. I know that. Um, my mother died of, of alcoholism. Uh, neither both my brother nor I, uh, we struggle with that. We just don't. Um, and today, I recognize really that my mother was in tremendous pain. Mm. Tremendous, tremendous pain. And she was a very high functioning alcoholic, you know, so she went to work and she helped us with homework and she cooked and all of it. Um, but today I understand how uh, upset she was mm. and how, how, you know, substances kind of make you a little fussy, right? Mm. Now what's interesting about that is that after a while you have to drink more. 
because it stops becoming effective, mm -hmm. right? Because you develop a physical uh, tolerance for it. However, what's also interesting is that from the moment that you decide, okay, I'm going to have a drink or a hit or whatever people do, from that moment, before they take the drink, they already feel their relief because, you know, of course, internally, right? It's, oh, I'm going to have a drink. I'm going to feel better. And even though I haven't taken a drink, there's already uh, a sense of relief, of course, right? Because of consciousness. Consciousness is give them a sense of relief because they're thinking. Mm -hmm. The moment is creating a sense of relief, although no substance has been taken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, also what's very interesting is that, I don't know if you know what a killing a high is, but killing a high is when people are under the influence of um, substances and they experience an intense situation. For example, a police officer comes to their house or something, right? Their body is still under the influence of the substance, but they're no longer high. So I would talk to a lot of kids that, were, that experienced this, right? They were using drugs. Cops would come to their house, knock on the door, like, you know, San Jose PD or whatever, and they all of a sudden lost their high, although their body was under the influence, which actually they got really upset about because, you know, people spend money on these things. So... So, you know, kind of going back to your question is, I think there are many things that can be helpful to share with a child that is in a situation like the one that I was in. Mm -hmm. And what was most helpful always for me, and what I've seen is more helpful, is to explain to them that they have a source in them of resiliency and wisdom. Because that actually brings hope. Mm. You know, um, I think it's important if you're working with kids or if you have kids to not get hooked with their situation, which can be intense and uh, compelling. Mm -hmm. It is important to recognize that life really doesn't come at us, right? Even kids, right? Even kids in difficult circumstances. That life works from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're working with kids and you know this, if you recognize that people are or have a capacity to, to be resilient, and if you can teach that to a kid, that will go a lot farther, mm -hmm. really, and it will help them not only with this particular circumstance, but with many others. Mm -hmm. right? Because we're not going to be teaching them just about alcohol or addiction. Mm -hmm. You're going to be teaching them about something that they can rely on, whether it's alcohol, like parents, or whether, whatever, whatever they're going through. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, how helpful is it to work with a child or to be with a child, seeing them not at the level of distress, uh, distressful thinking, because, you know, we experience distressful thinking, mm -hmm. not at that level, not getting confused between the child, the person in front of you, mm -hmm. and their thinking. So... You know, a lot of the work that I've done and a lot of the way, you know, a lot of actually sort of how I am in life, I just notice what happens when you are with human beings and you connect to them below their thinking, mm. the, you know, the heart of the matter. I mean, it just makes a complete uh, difference you don't have to say anything and you know kids are so um, in tune 
They're so in tune. Mm -hmm. But they recognize how you're looking at them. Mm -hmm. And we are so uh, sometimes um, concerned about them and worry about them that we don't, we don't listen. We don't just hang out with kids, especially kids that are in trouble. We have a tendency to start talking and start sharing and start kind of pushing content onto them so much mm -hmm. that their relationship of human being to human being is often forgotten. Mm -hmm. That's that's quite interesting. I had um, what I. I, I consider myself that I was for, fortunate when I was a kid that I, at a stage of my life I I only knew my my paternal parent grandparents uh, because my well my parents had to move countries due to the civil war and so on a anyway so I was the only I was the first grandchild so I was only child for the first five years of my life and one of the things that I remember very clearly that I used really used to love it was to listen to the adults conversation. And in particular with my grandparents, I would ask them questions and one of them would be so patient with me and explain at my level, but not, not from the level of higher down, high down, at a level that I could understand at a child's level, but really would give me full answers and I absolutely love that. And yeah, and they were like, wow, you ask great questions. And they would go out and explain the question, all the answers to the question that I asked. And and I guess that I, I was feeling really, really heard and valuable, uh, valued as a human being, not a, as a kid like pat on the, on the top of the head, but it's like, wow, you've got a question. Let's explore this together. Let's see where it takes us. Mm -hmm. and those moments, even though they were, well, it was only a short while, they are still in my memory. So yeah, very precious mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With my other grandma from my mom's side, because I, I didn't meet my grandma until I was seven years old. I don't have that connection. And it's like, it's mm -hmm. not something that I remember at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, some of us are really fortunate uh, because some of us have people in our lives that are, that recognize mm. uh, our humanity. Um, you know, Roger Mills, Dr. Roger Mills, um, he was just a master at that. He could walk into rooms with people uh, where experiences, experiencing life circumstances that were um, intense. You know, lots of poverty, lots of um, alcohol and drugs, lots of prostitution, lots of everything. And somehow he knew deeply um, that people are not their experiences and that people are not their thinking. Mm. So much that you just sort of kind of believed it. You started seeing it. You just started seeing it. Mm. Um, I saw him do this a lot. And I, I appreciated the fact that he just saw that as opposed, I mean, you know, he would teach, of course, he would teach, but, but there was something beautiful about knowing it, you know, just truly knowing it deeply. Um, so I tell you, if, if nothing else, if nothing else, when I have felt very um, upset about life, what seems to help me most is to be, I mean, you know, I, mean, I understand life comes from the inside out, but when I'm with somebody, I get out my capacity to bounce back. Mm. It's just, you know, it's just, so, um, so, yeah, you know, I think probably for the rest of my life, I will continue to share with people how they function through these principles because I find it extremely helpful, mm. you know, personally, and I have seen what happens, not only with women, but of course with men too, right? Yes, and yes, my, 
my, I guess the inspiration when I had this, the idea to do this show is naturally I, I can relate more. Well, the idea came fully formed, womanhood from the inside out. That is what I wanted to speak to. And one of the things I'm recognizing that when a, when a, when a woman gets um, a higher level of understanding and gets a, uh, an uplift in their own consciousness, naturally she automatically is affecting her family, she's automatically affecting the husband, the kids, all relationships because, well, men and women do have relationships, but women tend to be more relational. So I, I felt that the impact would be, would be more visible straight away but mm -hmm. it was it was the, my understanding and that because there is i i believe that it was the dalai lama who said that the western world will be saved by women so i thought well i don't have any grand ideas of saving the world but if i save one world at a time i'm happy with that starting with <laughs> it's all about personal transformation really mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Gabriella, i'm loving this conversation and i'm aware that we are moving towards the end of the show for today uh, what is the best for people for uh, what is the best way for people to find you? How can people find you? Um, well, I think I gave you my email. Um, they can find me at it's a little. Why don't you say it's J as in John G A B M G at gmail dot com. Or you can also find me. You know, as you said in my uh, bio. Um, I co-founded True Change Consultants. I'm no longer an owner, um, but I'm a partner. So if you want to go to True Change Consultants and get a hold of me, you can. Mm -hmm. You can also find me through Facebook. Um, they can find me through you. Right? True. We have friends on Facebook, yes. Friends are friends. <laughs> um, so, yeah, those are all many different ways you can find me. Okay, that's brilliant. And for me, for people who would like to find me, you can go to www.facebook.com forward slash klesia.mendes and I'll spell that. So that would be facebook.com forward slash C-L-E-S-I-A-M-E-N-D-E-S or you can go directly to my website. So that would be www.klesiamendes.com. And thank you very much for being with us for another episode of Womanhood from the Inside Out with lovely guest Gabrie Gabriella Maldonado Montano. Gabriella, before we go, would you like to leave, um, I wouldn't say a final message, a, a living thought with our audience for today? Oh my goodness, this is putting me on the spot, a living thought. Um, mm. You know, um, let me see, let me think if I have something profound to say or not so profound. Um, well, I think as, as I've become to understand these principles more and more, what's happened in my life is I just feel like life is a, a playground. Mm. You know, I think that's the, the result of it. There's a sense of lightness. Um, and, and that I love, you know, I love that I'm not afraid of life anymore. That's just, um, it's just, a, I think it was, a, it's the, the greatest gift. Yes. Um. Oh. Oh, that is lovely. I'm, I'm, I've, I've got goosebumps all over the body. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for being with us today. Mwah. Big kiss. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.